Well, good morning. Really enjoyed worship this morning. Enjoy coming here and hearing you all sing. You got so much talent here. It's amazing. Me and my wife, Liana, always talk about there's somebody different up there now. And there's a different piano player. It's like you got four or five of them. And good grief, you're just flowing with talent. That's great. I'd like to start off with a, a brief introduction, as I may, of who I am, uh, where I'm from, a little bit about that. As you heard, my name is Troy Metcher. Um, I grew up around Eldon initially for my first early years and then moved to Stover. Um, the Metchers are a German name, a German uh, community that lived around there, uh, pretty prominent. But I ended up moving over to Camdenton. That's where I ended up meeting my wife. Um, but we are excited to be here at Cornerstone. We're excited to be able to, to uh, get to know you all. We hail from a little town called Preston, Missouri. If you get on 65 and you head south, and you just keep going south and you just continue to go south, you'll run into Preston. Uh, it's about an hour away from here. And then if you turn at Preston and you head east on 54, about seven more miles, then go two miles down on Gravel Road, that's where we live. So it's about an hour and 15 minute drive um, to get here, but we really enjoy it. It's, it's worth it to be able to come here and worship with you guys. We're blessed with seven children, five that God gave us and then um, two more that he decided to bring into our life through our, our children being married. Um, they're all sitting back here except for two. I think I'm missing two this morning, but they're all on this back row. When I say your names, come up front, please. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, blessed with five children and then two more. So we have seven total. We have two grandkids. I know, I don't look old enough to be a grandpa, but I am. Um, we have one outside the womb and one cooking inside the womb presently uh, that we're blessed to, to have. They are a blessing. Everybody says that grandkids are way better than your kids. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, they're great. They're fun. They're a lot of fun to be around, but I enjoyed raising my kids as well. But it is fun that you don't have to change any diapers, and then when they get to fussing, you just leave them on with mom and dad and go on about your business. So, um, blessed, blessed to have such a, a great family that God has given us. Um, over the years. I work for the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, it's kind of my job is something that's a little bit confusing. Um, I'm what's called a femtech uh, maintenance control technician. I oversee a computerized program. It sounds really smart, doesn't it? But it ain't. Uh, I sit behind a desk and work on a computer um, all day long and it doesn't take many intelligence or much intelligence because I obviously do it. So um, I've been there for 12 years now. My wife, uh, Liana, back here, she is a bookkeeper at Warsaw School. She also used to work for the Corps of Engineers and she um, has recently taken a job there. Um, what else, what else can I tell you? My social security number is 918 -40. That's not really my social security number, but um, I can't think of anything else. We're just glad to be here, glad to get to know you all. I really think that everybody should get an opportunity to come up here and do this. Wouldn't you get to know each other a little bit better if you could just explain your history really quick? Uh, it'd be helpful, but you don't, but I do. So here I am. I'm, I'm glad to be able to be a part of this um, congregation. Um, now that you see who I am and you know a little bit about my family, I want to look into the Holy Scriptures this morning and see what God has for us, see what he wants to show us. If you have a copy of God's Word, you can turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at a passage that has comforted me many times and one that has been on my heart for a couple weeks now. Um, the holiday season, is, as you know, we're we're here at Christmas. That doesn't even seem possible. Doesn't seem like we could be here already, but we're here at the Christmas season. Um, and as you know, it can kind of be difficult uh, a lot of times on people that doesn't have large families, that doesn't have friends. Uh, it can somewhat be a lonely time, um, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. We serve a Lord that, that wants to come to us and wants to meet with us and wants to show himself to us. Our passage this morning is one that's going to help comfort us, I hope, during those times during those times. So without further ado, let's, let's read in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. 
It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning that you blessed us with. God, it's just a beautiful outside, nice, cool, crisp morning, Lord, just to step outside and, and Lord, just be a part of your creation. Lord, you brought us all here for a particular reason. Lord, you have something that you want us to hear, something you want us to learn. God, uh, you, you do nothing by accident, Lord. Everything is with purpose. And Lord, I'm grateful to be able to stand before these wonderful people, Lord, and just um, share what you've put on my heart. I pray, Lord, I don't say any more than what I should, Lord, but I just follow your leading and your prompting, God, and that you will be glorified and exalted in all that I say and all that I do. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. My plan this morning is to, to look at uh, some of the key words and statements by our Lord to hopefully encourage you in your walk with the Lord in this passage that we've just looked at. He starts out, Christ is, uh, Christ that is, by saying, Come unto me. Come unto me. And I believe that a lot of times it's the easiest part of instructions that tend to trip us up the most. That we, we kind of stumble on and we fall over. And it's kind of like putting something together. Um, you know, if you're a dad, you've, you've had things for your children and you've got different gifts that you have to put together. And remember them instructions that you would unfold and it would have like big box letters of A and then it would have certain steps here to do. And then B, certain steps here to do. Um, if you're like me, I don't follow a lot of instructions a lot of times. I just dig into it and do it. I have a construction background and I can fix anything. doesn't matter what it is, I'll figure it out. Well, that may be true, but I end up finding myself backpedaling because I skipped step one. I skipped the very first thing, so then I start taking things off in order to get this first thing back on. Uh, we went over to our daughter and son-in-law's house yesterday and just a perfect example it's helping them put their vanity in and I got down there and I start tightening all the plumbing up and I get it all set in carry the sink base in set it down and, and nothing's completely lined up I know better should have left it all loose so I can swing it all over and connect it and tie it all back but I didn't I skipped one of the the first steps that I needed to do and sometimes we have to we have to slow ourselves down and pay a little bit more of attention um, Sometimes, as we're working on things like that, we have to stop and take them apart in order to get them back together the way that they should be. So when you skip a step, that's what happens. It's no different with God's Word. It's no different with His Word. His first words here says, Come unto me. Come unto me. His first command is to come. It seems simple, doesn't it? But many times it's the most difficult thing to do. Just to come. It's funny. I mean, you know, we, we train dogs to sit. We train them to fetch and we train them to come. And they'll just do it. We talk to them, we say, come on, they come up there. But we stumble. Us, the more intelligent species, stumbles with that. It trips us up. So to come here, to come here is to yield. We're to yield ourselves over and to come to Christ. Quit trying and just come. Notice his first command here isn't learn. He doesn't start out by saying learn, learn this, study this, and then come. And he doesn't first say, take my yoke upon you. No, first he says to come. He says to move, get moving forward and come to me. To come is to leave from one position and to move to another. And it's to come now. Come now at this moment. Don't wait until you have this done or you have that done. Don't wait until you've overcame this sin in your life or that sin in your life. But to come, to come unto the Lord. Come now, not come later, but to come now. Uh, turn if you would, let's look at a few more verses that, that calls us to come. Turn if you would to John 6, 37. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. In Revelation 22, 17, says, And the spirit of the, of the bride, the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And in Isaiah 55, 
1 through 3. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delighteth in, in its fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So come, he says. Come to him. Those burdened with physical burdens, we should come to the Lord. Those burdened with emotional burdens, we should come to the Lord. We should move forward. Those with sorrow and grief, he's bidding us to come. Those with guilt of sin, he's calling us to come, to come to Christ. Christ is not singling out the naturally intelligent here. He's not saying, those that are the most intelligent people, come to me. I'd be in trouble if that was the case. He's not saying the most intelligent to come. He's not even saying the most strong are to come. But he's saying the little children, the babes, those weary and heavy laden are to come to him, to come to Christ. He says, come, just come. He doesn't say clean up first. He doesn't say, I want you to come do this or I want you to do that. And a lot of times churches can be really, really hard on this. A lot of times people don't want to come inside of our doors because they feel like I have all this sin, all this baggage, all these sayings, and people's going to judge me. Well, Christ is telling us all just to come. Come as we are. Come just as we are, and then he will do the work from that point on. But where are we to come to? Where are we to go? He says, unto me. Unto me. Come unto me. Not Troy. Dear Lord, I can't help you at all. I can't help you all. My whole purpose would be to point you to Christ. He says to come, and I'm going to point you to Christ. That's where we're supposed to go to. Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. James 4, 8 says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. And then turn, if you would, with me to John 14. John chapter 14. I want to read verses 1 through 6. John 14, 1 through 6. It says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So that tells us there is no other way. There's no other way to the Lord, no other source of help. Even if God leads us to an individual, and that's where we find the help, it was Christ that was working through them to minister to us. So it all always comes back to Christ. It's always Christ. So whatever you're struggling with today, Christ is the source of the help. He's the source. As Brother Chris said last week, our God is a faithful God. He's a faithful God. Uh, if my wife has said it to me once, she said it a hundred times. God does not forsake his children. God does not forsake his children. God does not forsake his children. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter how hard life can get, no matter what kind of trials are upon you, what you're looking at, whether it's health conditions, whether it's financial, it doesn't matter what it is. God does not forsake his children. Plant that deep down inside your mind. That will encourage you when times come. God does not forsake his children. Come to him. He's the answer. He's always going to be the answer, no matter what. Christ is always the answer. So, why Christ? Why Christ? Why come to Christ? Well, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, 22 through 25. It says, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Verse 24. 
But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. To the uttermost, he says here. That come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. That's why he lives. That's his whole purpose, is to make intercession for his people, for his children. For such an high priest became us, who is wholly harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. The heavens. Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 13 and 14 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. In Galatians, just a couple more here. In Galatians 13, or 3, um, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then in 1 John 2, 1 and 2, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, because we will sin, we will make mistakes, we will fall short, we will miss the mark. But if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. So, why Christ? Why Christ? He's the, he is the way. He is the way. He is the only way. There is no other way. Uh, it's, it's, it's not this way and this way will get you to Christ. No, it's just through Christ. It's just through Christ that we can make it. Next he says, all who are weary and are heavy laden. All who are weary and are heavy laden. And who doesn't struggle here? Does anybody ever have trials in their life? Oh good, five people. The rest of y'all could help teach us how to get past life without trials. It'd be really helpful. That'd be really helpful. But one thing's for certain. You are either in a trial, or you're coming out of a trial, or you're getting ready to go into a trial. That's just life, isn't it? I mean, such is life. That, that's the way it is for us. Uh, it's the stages of life. Uh, one may say, my life is so good that I just can't relate to what you're saying. I just don't understand at all with what you're saying. Well, bless your heart. Bless your heart that you don't struggle at all in life. But you know, a lot of people do. A lot of people do. And I think if we'd be honest with ourselves, there's not a person in here that doesn't have hard moments in their life, hard things that we deal with and that we have to face. And we need to come to, come to the Lord and hand it over to Him. And it doesn't matter even if you, if you like it or not. It doesn't matter if you, if you don't want to have a trial. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. They come and they go and there's nothing we can do to stop them from showing up in our lives. Absolutely nothing. They're, they're just going to happen. A.W. Pink, he's a reformed preacher um, from back, born in the late 1880s, I believe, and died somewhere in the 1950s, early 1950s. But um, he had this quote I found. It's really, really, really good. Listen to this. He says, Faith endures as seeing him who is invisible. It endures the disappointments, the hardships, and the heartaches of life by recognizing that all, all comes from the hand of him who is too wise to err and too loving to be unkind. I'm going to read that again. Faith endures as seeing him who is invisible. It endures the disappointments, the hardships, and the heartaches of life by recognizing that all comes from the hand of him who is too wise to err and too loving to be unkind. So, God is allowing or causing whatever you're going through. He's allowing or he's causing whatever it is that we are going through in life. And he's too wise to err and he's too loving to give us something that won't better us. He will not give us something that's not going to better us. So if you're facing a trial right now and it's the hardest thing in your life that you can face and that you've ever gone through, we've got to get to a place where we can thank the Lord for that. Because he's doing it to better us. He's doing it to strengthen us. He's doing it to make us more in his image. It kind of makes you feel a little bit different about a trial, doesn't it? When you read quotes like that. When you read statements like that. 
So what are you struggling with? What has you worn out? What has you so tired? Um, you may say, you know, you don't know what I'm dealing with. You don't know what I'm going through at all. And you know what? You're, you're right. You're right. I, I don't. I don't know what you're going with, what you're going through. I don't know what has you worn out. But I know someone that does. I know someone that understands. Hebrews 14. Let me get to it here. I'm sorry. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. I may not know what you're facing, but Christ does. Christ knows what you're going through, and he can relate to what you're facing and what you're going through right now. So with confidence, we come to him that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Come unto Christ, all who are weary and heavy laden, all who deal with sorrow and sin. We're told to come, to come to him, lay it all down at his feet. Why? Why do we do that? Well, the, the rest of our passage goes on to tell us about that. So that we may obtain rest. So that we may obtain some rest. So what is rest? What is rest? You know, sometimes I, I tell my wife that I wish that I had a switch. I wish I had a switch right here on my forehead that I could just flip down and just turn my brain off. Just shut things off for a while. Just kill it. You know, and if I was smart, I would probably not put it in the front of my head because it would show. Maybe in the back of the head where a hair could cover it up. Or maybe just be able to tug on an ear or something and turn it on and off. You know, but to be able to shut things down and to be able to, to, to rest for a little bit. But that can't happen. It can't happen. As much as we would like to have something like that, it can't happen. So what is rest then? What is rest? It is a rest for the soul. Salvation. It's a rest from sorrow. Uh, I know when it's been a long, long week uh, and a lot of things have gone wrong at work and there's just been struggles with life just in general, uh, a rest for me would be to come home and be able to sit on my front porch, my porch swing. We live out in the middle of the woods, just, just surrounded by timber. Uh, just be able to sit on the front porch swing uh, with my wife there. Hopefully all my kids have come over to visit. We've just finished a meal and we're just sitting there relaxing. Maybe a little music playing in the background, George Strait or Don Williams maybe or something like that. I'm a country guy. If you don't like that, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But um, maybe some of that playing in the background and just, just resting, enjoying my family, enjoying their, just letting things just roll off and just sit there and to rest. But I don't, I don't think that that's the kind of rest that he's referring to here. I don't think that that's what he's talking about. Well, first off, don't overlook the fact that this rest that he's talking about is a gift. It's a gift. Remember what he says? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you I will give you. He's going to give that rest. So don't overlook the fact that it's a gift. Many times in life, we strive. We strive, we work, we sweat to obtain. But this rest is offered as a free gift. It's something that we don't have to do anything for. You know, I don't know if I've ever showed up at a job and just said, I don't, I don't think I need to do anything today. I just go there and sit down in my seat, put my feet up and do absolutely nothing. And my boss come out and just say, all right, I'm going to pay you. Boy, you know, you did great today. I'm going to pay you for what you did. I didn't do anything, you know. But this is a free gift that he's offering us. This is a free gift. When we go out and we work, we're striving, we're sweating, we're, we're earning our wage. And this we can't earn, though. This is something that we, that we are unable to earn. So don't overlook the fact that, first, it's a gift. Second, it's personal. It's personal. He says, I will give you. He says, I will give you. He gives it to you. To you as an individual. He gives this to you. Specifically. That means he comes to where you are. He singles you out. And he says, Troy, since you came to me as I drew you to myself. Don't overlook that. It all starts with the Lord. It all starts with Christ. As he draws us to him and we surrender and we walk to him, he gives us what? Rest. 
He gives us rest. Now you can attain yours. You can't have mine. It's mine. But he offers it to all. He offers it to you. So that same rest, he's offering it to you. So that shows me, that shows me that he's a relational God. He is a relational God. He's not distant God, one that doesn't want to commune with his people. He's one that wants to have a relationship with you and, and walk with you and talk with you. So now back to this gift that he offers, rest. I believe it's salvation. It's rest from sorrows of this world. It's rest from the power of sin. Uh, not the temptation, because Satan is, well, that wretch is talented at what he does, isn't he? He's, a, he's very good at his trait. He really is. He's very good at temptation. So I don't believe it's necessarily a rest from that temptation, but it's a rest from that power of sin in our lives. It's a rest from that. Turn back to Matthew 11. Now, before we read some of these, some of these verses, in the beginning of the chapter, Christ has an encounter with John's servant. Then he begins to denounce some of the cities where many of the miracles were, were performed because they just would not repent. They wouldn't do it. Um, back in 11, we're going to start reading in verses uh, 21 through 24. There's some really difficult words in here, and I'm just a simple country boy, so if I don't pronounce them wrong, just laugh at me, I guess. But woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes." But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Then in verses 25, 26, and 27. He says, at the time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hast revealed them unto the babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, for he to whomsoever the Son will reveal himself. I believe he's saying here, I believe he's saying rest was not offered to you because you did not repent. You did not repent, so it was not offered. The wise and the prudent, or the ESV, I believe, says the understanding. But it's offered to the babes. It's offered to the little children. John MacArthur says this. He says, these words identify the Jewish leaders sarcastically as wise and prudent and the followers of Christ as infants. Yet God has revealed to these followers the truth of the Messiah and his gospel. He goes on to say, Christ is openly inviting all who hear, but it is phrased such that only ones who will respond are those burdened by their own spiritual bankruptcy and the weight of trying to save themselves by keeping the law. It is a rest offered from endless, fruitless effort to save oneself by works of the law. Rest speaks of a permanent respite and the grace of God completely apart from works. I could not have said that better if I had read it right out of his commentary. I actually put that down out of his commentary. He said it so well. He says it so well. This is just another place in Scripture that shows you cannot know God by worldly wisdom or learning. It's impossible. If you think you're going to get to know God just by opening these Scriptures and reading them, and He's never done a change in your heart, it's impossible. It's impossible. You can get some head knowledge, but it ain't going to fall down here, and it's not going to grab a hold. You won't be transformed. You have to have that work of the Holy Spirit within your life. And if he begins that work, he's going to complete it, as it says in Philippians 1.6. Being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus' return. That has been a scripture that has really encouraged me many times as my kids over the years have struggled to know whether they're saved or whether they're not. It's encouraged me because I can see the Spirit working inside of their life. So I've, I've went back to that verse many times, being confident in this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it. That's the Holy Spirit doing a work in their life. That was the Holy Spirit stirring and working in their life. And I take confidence in that. If he started that work, he's going to finish it and he'll complete it. 
He'll complete it. So that should encourage us. So if he's offering rest, why is he then telling us to take up a yoke? He's saying, come to me and rest. Then he says, take my yoke. That sounds like work, doesn't it? That sounds like some work we have to do. A yoke is something that's placed on animals. Usually uh, in the Bible time, it was like oxen, and it was used for work. It goes over their necks, and it was used to pull or plow something. And it would take two animals to put them together and allow them to be able to work together well. So what work must we do for Christ that gives us rest? He's telling us, come to me, I'm going to give you rest. Then he says, take this yoke. Take this yoke. So what, what's, he, what's he talking about? What work can we do that will offer us rest? Well, I think it's simple. We must believe and we must abide. We must believe and we must abide in him. That is really all the work that is required of us as Christians. Believe in him and abide in him. If we do those things, he will work all those other areas of our lives out. He'll grow us. He'll mature us. As we get into his word, we're abiding in him. We're studying his word. We're digging in it. We're chewing on it. He's going to work all that other stuff out. But we have to get into his word and believe and abide in him. It, um, let's see, where was that? On the cross, Christ took your yoke and my yoke of sin and he paid for all of it. He took your yoke and he paid for it. Then in return, he offers you and me to take his yoke, which is what? It's easier. It's lighter. He accomplished all the work. All we must do is believe and abide in him, which in turn, he helps you to do. He helps you to do. It implies you are not carrying it alone. He's attached with you on this journey. He said in our passage, remember, he says, learn from me. Learn from me. How can we learn from him if he's not right there helping us and guiding us and leading? So he's attached there with that yoke on us. And he's helping us and leading us and guiding us. How can one learn if he's not walking with us or showing us the way? How can we? We have to have him right there leading and showing us the way. As we prepare for invitation, I have a, a few questions I want to ask you. What are you, what are you going through this morning? What are you facing and what are you going through this morning? Because you're going through something. We, you know, I can be the, the very best of all of them to come in here and put on a face and a smile. I remember growing up, um, my dad was a pastor. And um, I remember our phone would ring at times at the house. And my dad, make sure they're not in here. That'd be really embarrassing. My dad and stepmom would be um, in an argument. Just a good old argument. You know, like all married couples can get into at different times. Just a good argument. That phone and ring and all just transfer into the spirit. I mean, just completely change just to the sweetest natured person in the world. You know? We can put on an image. We can put on this, this image that everything looks okay and everything's fine. But everybody's dealing with something. All of us have something going on in our life. So what are you struggling with this morning? We have a high priest, a great high priest, who wants to meet you where you are. Is the Spirit drawing you to himself? Is the Spirit working in you right now? Has he been working on you? Is, is, has people been planting and watering? And the Lord's just waiting. You know, you're just waiting for that to, to, to come to fruition, to come to completeness? That's him working. That's him doing and drawing himself or drawing you to himself. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Give it to God. Rest in God. Take his yoke. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. It is not maybe I will give it, but it says I will give it. It's yours. It's yours to take. If the Lord is working on you this morning, don't wait. Don't put it off. Come to him. Come to him. He's faithful.